Hi, my name is Richard Preston. I'm a software engineer at the MITRE Corporation and lead instructor for the Beaverworks Summer Institute Quantum Software Development course. I'm so excited for the students to share what they've learned during the program, but first I just want to take a minute to explain why I think this topic is so important. If you've heard of quantum computing, you may believe that this is just the latest development in computing technology that is going to make your iPhone run faster, but this is not the case. Quantum computing is a fundamentally new way of processing information using the principles of quantum mechanics. So this means that there are things we can do with quantum computers that we just simply can't do on the types of computers that we use today. So to me, this is one of the most exciting emerging technologies right now because it really holds the potential to transform the world in surprising ways, similar to the way digital computers have transformed it over the last half century. Now, the problem with basing your computation on quantum mechanics is that this is an area that has typically been reserved for PhD physicists. So when my colleague Joe Klappis and I first decided to offer this class in 2021, we set out to prove that you didn't need a PhD to work on quantum computing. In fact, students can get started with this as early as high school. Of course, the Beaverwork students are no ordinary high schoolers. Uh, so over the last four weeks, they have gone from little to no experience with quantum computing to writing quantum software programs implementing real quantum algorithms. They've also gotten the chance to speak to leading experts in industry and academia, spanning a variety of topics in quantum information science. So this is truly a, a graduate level course and the students should be incredibly proud of what they've achieved. So on behalf of the course staff and everyone at BWSI, thank you for participating in this final event. I think you'll be absolutely blown away by what the students have to share. All right, and so kicking it off to the first group, we have Quarky Qubits. So Melvin's gonna pull up the video in a sec. Um, and I uh, just wanna mention that we will be taking questions on Slido. So uh, I'll be looking at those and have a chance to ask uh, a one or two questions to each group after their video is played. Hi, I'm Zeal. I'm Nathan. I'm Jason. And I'm Karen. Our group is Sherlock Ohms. For the past two weeks, we've been researching and implementing the variational quantum eigensolver. Our final goal was to implement an algorithm that will calculate the lowest possible energy state of a molecule's electron configuration. This ground state is useful in chemistry because it tells us a lot about the properties of a molecule. But before we can go into the algorithm, we need to start by reviewing the basics of what a co quantum computer is and how it can expedite the process of finding the lowest possible energy state. What you mainly need to know is that a qubit can be in a state between 0 and 1, that qubits can be entangled, and that this makes quantum computers faster than normal computers at certain tasks. The variational quantum eigensolver, or VQE, is one of these tasks. VQE is an example of a variational quantum algorithm. So basically, in English, this means that it has both a classical and a quantum part. These types of algorithms first initialize some parameters, do some measurements, and then use an optimizer to get new, better parameters to repeat the process with. The VQE helps define the minimum eigenvalue of a matrix. Now, what does that even mean, and why does it matter? Well, when we apply the VQE to, say, a matrix that represents the energy of a molecule, the algorithm could find the upper bounds of ground state energy of a Hamiltonian, which is generally the first step in computing the energetic properties of molecules and materials. It uses an algorithm to find the lowest energy state of molecules, a major problem that is central to quantum chemistry. And in even simpler terms, it just helps simulate the molecules, and scientists can use that to calculate stuff, specifically for medical or chemical applications. The scope of the VQE is therefore very wide, being potentially relevant for drug discovery, material science, and chemical engineering. We have methods using traditional computers, but it's super resource intensive for accurate calculations on large systems. This poses challenges in the applications of such methods, which, as you can guess, the variational quantum eigensolver can solve. We began our research by looking through various articles and videos on the algorithm, but we quickly moved on to reading published papers. One of the biggest hurdles was just trying to parse the paper's notations and terminology, which was something we spent several days on. We eventually decided that the most manageable way to work through the papers was to divide up the different aspects of the algorithm amongst ourselves, which allowed each of us to focus on understanding one piece of the algorithm in detail. 
This also meant that we each encountered different challenges when it came to the actual implementation. It was difficult enough to understand what the algorithm was doing, but it was a completely different challenge to understand how to write it. After fumbling through the papers for a while, we decided to write only the quantum piece from scratch and import all the classical stuff from outside libraries. Easy enough, right? Well, this paper explains everything one way, this one is 91 pages long and says something else, that one's outdated, and I don't even know what's happening here. Anyway, we eventually found something that worked and had no further issues. Shoot, go away. No further issues. So while all of that was going on, those of us working on the quantum part were continuing to grapple with the published papers we mentioned earlier. Again, the challenge there was twofold. We first had to understand how the algorithm worked in the first place, which required math and terminology that we had very little knowledge of. And then we had to figure out a way to map that understanding into actual code. This, as you can imagine, took a while, and YouTube videos and the course instructors ended up being the most helpful resources we had. We did eventually get our code written, combined, and run, allowing us to determine the ground state energy of the H molecule. Yep, just hydrogen. Because quantum computers that can run large models don't exist yet, we had to use the smallest case there is. But we did get a number that's pretty close to the real answer, so we know that the algorithm works. The VKE is one of those few useful quantum algorithms that could still be run on our current era of small, noisy quantum computers. They're small because they each have a very limited number of qubits, and they're noisy because the qubits are still most likely ran to randomly decohere or randomly lose their quantum state. Still at the scale, the VQE can only be used for determining the ground state energies of very small molecules, and for our implementation, we chose hydrogen. Our algorithm ended up having a width of 4 and a depth of 7 for one iteration, meaning that it took 4 qubits and 7 gates. Wow, who cares? Well, we do, and you should too. We just demonstrated to you the amazing VQE on a real quantum computer. There are a lot of theoretical algorithms out there that sound nice, but they require a noise-free computer with hundreds of qubits. Like we said, the VQE is one of the few algorithms we can implement, and that may actually prove useful in the near future for things like finding new medicines and developing new materials. Our main takeaway was a slightly better grasp at the technical vocabulary that's often used around quantum computing. Of course, we still struggle through published papers just like everyone else, but now we struggle a little less. We also learned just how small the quantum computing community really is when we met the literal founder of the company that wrote one of Karen's demon libraries. And I don't even know what's happening. We also learned that we couldn't do this without our TA, so we want to thank them for helping us throughout the whole process. Thanks for watching. Great, thank you so much. So just a correction, so this was Sherlock Ohms. Uh, not uh, not quirky qubits. Quirky qubits will be next. Um, so perhaps that may segue into uh, into one question for for Sherlock Holmes is you know we've had some technical difficulties related to being virtual, and so and this is something we've talked about in the course. But I'm wondering if any of you want to give some thoughts on what the experience is like, Ben, as a virtual course, some of the let's say pros and cons, um, and how you worked as a team virtually. So, um, and for this project, we like set up a whole GitHub account or a GitHub repository so we could all collaborate on the code. And basically, like the video mentioned, we tried to divide up our work. So then we would look at the different parts of the algorithm, like parts of the quantum software. And uh, overall, we were pretty active on the Zoom, um, Zoom rooms and also our own, uh, like our own Discord. Uh, our Discord like group, so we were able to communicate and like work through problems together that way. Nice, nice. And also, yeah. um, what's it called? Many of our problems that we had to do were online, anyways. So it wasn't a big deal that we were doing this program online. It didn't like hinder our like program goals to do anything. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and we did also get a question online. So um, how would you go about using VQE for molecules larger than hydrogen, such as helium or oxygen? Well, currently there are simulators that can a whole that can support um, larger simulations. 
um, though those take a very significant amount of runtime. It takes an extremely long time to do all of the computations that a quantum computer would do like natively on its own. Um, but large simulations are also hard to do on non-quantum computers for different reasons, which is that simulating a qubit or a, p a piece of quantum information is also extremely difficult and resource intensive. Uh, but yep, so next group, quarky qubits. Back to you, Melvin. Hi, I'm Andrea. I'm Harsha. I'm Caroline. I'm Jenna. And we're the quarky qubits. And today we're going to talk about the variational quantum eigensolver. So molecules can be represented by matrices, called a Hamiltonian. To model the molecule, you'll have to solve certain mathematical equations that minimize the associated energy. Knowing this minimized value will inform us of important molecular properties which could aid the process of drug development, such as the time interval for the drugs to take effect or the pattern of diffusion into the bloodstream. In this way, modeling of chemical interactions can have monumental impacts on drug discovery and development. The problem that we face with finding this minimum energy is that with classical computers, computation time scales exponentially with the size of the system. Working with larger molecules gets very expensive very, very quickly. However, quantum bits on a quantum computer, called qubits, can achieve this using only a linearly growing set of qubits due to a unique property called superposition, or the ability of quantum state systems to be in multiple states at once, which can decrease runtime significantly. In this manner, quantum computers harness the unique principles of quantum mechanics. Quantum algorithms, in turn, often utilize these principles to efficiently compute answers to classically unsolvable problems, such as minimizing the energy of the Hamiltonian in the case of the VQE. The VQE can also be applied to many other fields besides chemistry. Using computer simulations, the VQE can be applied to advanced material science, chemical engineering, and even finance for portfolio optimization, as well as stimulate developments in fields such as nuclear physics, higher energy physics, and vibrational spectroscopy. For this problem, an algorithm called quantum phase estimation was proposed. While it was a pioneering idea, the current limitations of quantum technology make implementation of QPE implausible due to the billions of quantum logic gates needed. The circuits are very deep. In contrast, the variational quantum eigensolver is a hybrid solution, utilizing both quantum and classical computational techniques using much shallower circuits and less qubits, making its implementation much more practical. The VQE uses a sort of guess and check method to solve for the minimum energy state. There are three things to understand. The quantum and classical part can be covered later, but the essential part of the math is the variational principle, which essentially leverages the fact that the energy at any arbitrary state has to be greater than or equal to the minimum energy value. To solve this problem on a more computational basis, we must first translate the molecular chemistry into quantum information. This can be done by mapping the Hamiltonian distances to a sum of quantum gates. In the quantum realm, we can then select a trial wave function that we can use to calculate the minimum energy. Then, using a classical machine optimizer, we can iteratively approve upon the parameters of that initial wave function until we get as close as we can to the minimum energy. We implemented this algorithm in QSharp to get a better understanding of the circuiting concepts, as well as Qiskit to simulate the algorithm on one of IBM's quantum computers. For one iteration in one sample, we can look at the resources required to run this algorithm. Here we can see the metric for qubit Clifford, which is the total count of gates, and qubit count, which is the maximum number of qubits allocated. Note that the resources are very low for one iteration. However, there's a much larger total cost because there are a number of optimization steps and we need to multiply by the number of samples for accurate results. We can then look at a graph comparing the number of Clifford gates used for QPE and VQE for 1000 samples. We can see that VQE uses much fewer resources and a smaller molecule like H2 is much more feasible compared to a larger molecule like caffeine. Using the Qiskit implementation, we were able to simulate the lithium hydride molecule on IBM State Vector Simulator. The simulator is based purely in the mathematics behind the code, resulting in a perfect scenario. Real quantum computers have noise, but this IBM simulator runs our code without noise. The actual energies and calculated VQE energies are almost identical, with an average margin of error being 0.00041 Hartree, an atomic unit of energy. We were unable to run the Qiskit implementation on an IBM quantum computer because our circuit requires 8 qubits, whereas only 7 are publicly available. 
We then tried simulating the same molecule in IBM's CASM simulator, one that factors in quantum noise. We found that the noise significantly lengthened the time that it took to run. When noise is added into the equation, the VQE is much less robust. Understanding documentation was a big challenge. Much of our time was spent learning the background math and chemistry, studying eigenvalues and the Schrodinger equation. When it came to coding, the Kiska textbook we initially referenced was outdated, most of the imports deprecated. We pushed through the import errors to get a working version of the VQE in both Kiska and QSharp. Our key takeaways relate to the practicality of the VQE. Today, quantum computers are not robust enough to handle large molecules. The largest molecule to be modeled accurately on a real quantum computer is beryllium hydride, which is just three atoms. With the current state of quantum computers, modeling organic molecules, as seen in pharmaceuticals, is impractical. However, that might not be the case for long. As quantum computing power increases, we could soon see drug design accelerated due to the optimized methods used in the VQE. We mainly referenced the Kiskit textbook and looked at several papers about real-world applications of the VQE. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so we did get a couple of questions online, and I think this ties in with your presentation. So how difficult was it learning the math related to quantum software while you're still in high school? So which math equations do you find most difficult to understand, maybe that were outside of your curriculum from the courses you've taken so far? So most of the math in the general class was based in linear algebra, which helped us understand the circuits and like what was happening behind the scenes. And then specific to our implementation of the VQE, uh, we had to learn a lot about matrices and eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then for the chemical application, um, I looked at the Schrodinger equation, which is not easy to understand at all, but um, it did help me gain a new level of understanding for the ground state energy. Yeah, we have another question. Um, what new innovations have sped up or had the possibility of speeding up uh, Q Q VQE and QPE simulations? Um, and is there simulations allowing for parallelization? So this might be a little bit out of scope of your project, but maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the progress of, of quantum computers, where we've been and where we are today, and, and maybe the progress and limitations that you've experienced. Uh, yeah, so right now, uh, quantum computers are generally very error prone. Uh, like, uh, we tried to run our Kiskit implementation on uh, 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 one of IBM's quantum computers, which didn't go really well. It was actually so error prone that I believe it wasn't able to run because of the amount of tasks, iterations that, was, that uh, the program had to do. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, hopefully in the future, we'll, uh, as uh, more error, al error correction algorithms come out and uh, we can implement those error correction algorithms, we might be able to like, have, a more, uh, have more complex molecules uh, modeled and uh, ran on quantum computers. Nice. Cool. So yeah. Um... Great answers. I think we can move on to the next team. So thank you, Quirky Qubits. So next is the quantized pandas. Hi, my name is Davish. My name is Eric. My name is Michelle. And my name is Mohammed. And we are the quantized pandas. Quantum overview. A quantum computer is a new type of computer that takes advantage of the properties of quantum mechanics. A quantum algorithm is an algorithm that runs on a quantum computer. A qubit is the fundamental unit of information in quantum com computing. It's compared, it's like a classical bit. It takes advantage of a superposition, which allows for the qubit to be in a zero state, a one state, and everything in between. But why is this useful? It's because quantum computers speed up tasks that would take naturally forever on a regular computer. So some of the applications. Quantum computers allow us to simulate pulses of different natures, which may let us create fluid flow simulations, create fast and advanced financial simulations, and train neural networks more efficiently than classical computers. To do these, we need to solve systems of linear equations really, really quickly, and a lot of them all together, which we can do with the quantum advantage of the HHL algorithm. The hero has the Lloyd algorithm, also known as the HHL algorithm. So the HHL algorithm takes a matrix A, which contains the coefficients of the equations that we want to solve. 
solution vector B contains the value on the right hand of the equal sign. And the output solution vector X contains the variables that we're solving for. Here you can see the circuit diagram of the HHL algorithm. We start with the initialization of B, phase estimation, controlled rotation, inverse phase estimation, measurement, and then post-processing. So the first step in the algorithm is to prepare the data vector B. Quantum state preparation is important because we can't directly work with classical data in quantum computing. So we need vector B to be scaled into the amplitude of the qubit. Quantum phase estimation. QPE helps us to measure any self adjoint matrix. Quantum computers permit us to measure individual qubits, but if we need to measure a more complex observable algorithm, we have to use quantum phase estimation. Inverse QPE is required after doing QPE inside of an algorithm in order to measure a qubit. At the high level, QPE essentially prepares the eigenstates of the Hermitian operator in the register and stores the corresponding eigenvalue in the second register. Eigenvalue inversion. This is the magic and what makes the HHL algorithm work. The goal is to put the qubit register into the state seen to the right. This seems hard, but this can be achieved by rotating the first qubit in the register about the y-axis, based on the eigenvalues that was previously encoded into the qubit registers by the QPE. Classical post-processing. Most algorithms today are hybrid algorithms, meaning that they're both quantum and classical in nature. For the quantum portion, we run it 10,000 times, or we have 10,000 shots. That means we get 10,000 measurements. Of these measurements, we only count the measurements that end with a 1. And of those measurements, we take the probability of measuring a 0 in the first instance and a 1 in the first instance. Taking both those probabilities, we take the square root, and this prepares our x state, which contains our variables that we're solving for. But if we take these values and divide both of them, we'll get the ratio of the x and y variables. Results. We ran our algorithm on IBM's quantum computers, Oslo and Nairobi, and it really shows the amount of error that you can find in today's quantum computers. Our algorithm sh should negate the effects of computations on the, second two on the second qubit and the third qubit. But here we can see that a lot of our measurements have one states in the second and third qubits. This goes to show the amount of error that you find in today's quantum com computers. This is what an ideal simulation would look like. We see that there are all zeros in the second and third qubits. And of the last qubits, there are two that we measured with one. And one has one measurement is 0, 0, 0, 1. And the other is 1, 0, 0, 1. We see that both of these have probability about 2.5, which means that the ratio of our variables is a one -to -one, about a 1 to 1 ratio. So some of the resource estimation of the HHL algorithm that we implemented. So the qubit count used was four qubits used, and we used 49 gates within the HHL algorithm, and the average circuit construction time was about 3.729 nanoseconds. So overall, this HHL algorithm was extremely efficient because of the relatively few gates used, the quick construction time, and the low amount of qubits used in all. And this algorithm is very efficient to use because of the low amount of qubits used, and the relatively low amount of gates used allows us to manipulate a qubit with lower amounts of potential error in between because there are fewer environmental factors like photonic rays that can disrupt the qubit between its first use and its final measurement. Our main obstacle is understanding the notation of the math operations in the language that research papers use. When we finished the code, another big problem was understanding what the output meant and how to use it. So with some time and help from the instructors, we were able to solve these issues. Thank you so much for listening and we hope you enjoyed our presentation. Awesome, thank you. So, so yeah, I, I think uh, this is a theme emerging. You know, many of these algorithms that you all selected are uh, quite advanced. <laughs> so I think one of the questions people might want to hear about is how did you go about selecting this algorithm to study and implement? Uh, yeah, thoughts on that? Um, so we were provided with a list of possible algorithms and we looked through and saw what would be a what we thought would be a feasible algorithm and something that looked interesting at the same time. Um, we saw this one that seemed fairly straightforward because it was just, uh, you know, it's algebra 2, it's just, you know, linear equations and you solve them. But apparently, actually solving those using quantum computers isn't as simple as doing algebra 2. 
So I guess that produced some struggles, but that was kind of the thought process behind it. Yeah, John has a question. Go for it. Yeah, um, yeah. My question is, what, how did you go about dividing the work? Like, we're all separate right now, and there's this big project. What was your process of like figuring out who's going to do what um, and like delegating back? Um, I can probably take this one. So, like at first, we were definitely going to stick together just because I don't think any of us had a lot of experience like looking through all the research papers because they were worded in a really technical way. So, I think that at first. It was really nice how we stuck together, but then as we dive deeper into the algorithm and kind of looked at the circuit diagrams, um, we divided the work based on the stages of the diagram and like the steps in the algorithm. Yeah, we had an uh, upvoted question about agile, uh, agile development, agile methods. Do you? Uh, we didn't really talk about agile much in class, but are you familiar with that or or no? We know absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I remember I said one of my the, teams like my Kanban chat. chart <laughs> I was like hey uh, this is Agile um, you can mess it if you want and they're like we got it <laughs> so yeah a small enough team so I think you all were working very closely together so we didn't do any formal Agile processes but um, had to mention that it's a very upvoted question okay um, well thank you uh, so thank you Quantize Pandas we'll move on to Blue Mandrels my name is Herschel I'm Audrey. I'm Abusha. I'm Christina. And this past summer, we worked on the quantum approximation optimization algorithm. So some quantum computing background. Quantum computing is a type of computing that leverages the quantum properties of small particles to solve certain problems that classical computers just cannot solve in reasonable time. The difference between quantum and classical computing boils down to the fundamental unit of information. Classical computers use a bit, which can either mean the zero or one state while quantum computers utilize a qubit, which can be zero, one, or some combination of the two, which we call superposition. A good analogy here is to think about bits as a switch with only on and off states, while qubits are more like a dial, which can be some intermediate value between on and off. Now some background to the QAOA. QAOA is a near-term quantum algorithm that tries to approximate the optimal solution to some problem. QAOA reaches this solution by trying to reduce some predefined cost function via a series of quantum transformations. This cost function varies based on the problem at hand. And since QAOA is a near-term algorithm, it requires less qubits and is less vulnerable to error, making it far more feasible to run on today's quantum computers. So what problem does QAOA exactly solve? Well, the answer is the combinatorial optimization problem which are problems which try, just try to find the best combination of a series of actions or where variable assignments for a particular value. In this presentation, we will go through two such examples, max cut and the traveling salesman problem. Additionally, QAOA has many interesting real-world applications, with some of the main ones being infrastructure, such as designing highways with the optimal amount of connections, finance, which includes portfolio management, and supply chain solutions. So what is max cut? MaxCut is an algorithm that separates the nodes of a graph to maximize the number of edges between the partitions. So in the graph below, as you can see, all of the edges that have the opposite nodes, one on one side and zero on the other, are counted, and the edges that have the same nodes are not counted. The MaxCut problem has many applications in various fields, such as circuit layout design, which creates integrated circuits and computer chips, and network design, which creates communication networks. When implementing our QAOA, our aim is to minimize the cost function based on problem constraints. Basically, the path that cuts through the most edges will have a lower cost. We can do this classically by optimizing our parameters for the rotation gates. Using Qiskit, we can then create a quantum circuit to apply the quantum transformations necessary to bring our qubit to the solution state as shown below. We can then run this on a quantum computer and measure the results. This should be a bit string that represents the path which cuts the most amount of edges in a graph. We ran this algorithm on three different machines, listed here in decreasing accuracy. The two tall peaks in the graphs represent the optimal solutions. The probabilistic simulator, which eliminates noise, has the most pronounced peaks, while the noise simulator, which simulates decoherence, has less defined peaks. Yet both simulators use the same amount of qubits depth in the type of gates. As expected, IBM's gate-based quantum computer has the longest construction time and the least pronounced peaks, most likely due to the sensitivity of the machine, which amplifies noise, decoherence, and errors. 
We also explored the Traveling Salesman Problem, or TSP. TSP is a well-known and difficult NP-complete problem in math and computer science. NP-complete means that the solutions of TSP can be verified quickly, and if we were able to quickly find a solution to this problem, we could find the solution to all other problems whose solutions can be verified quickly. So, this problem is important because it is applicable and adaptable to many different optimization problems. TSP can be thought of as trying to find the shortest closed path, starting and ending on the same node that visits every node on a graph exactly once. To solve TSP, our goal is to minimize our cost function, which is defined by our problem constraints because we want to minimize distance. We do this by converting to a quantum circuit and applying quantum transformations, and then running the program on a quantum computer to get our desired output, which includes the order of the nodes in the path and the total distance traveled. We ran this implementation on a three node graph first, which took an average execution time of about four seconds. Our program needed to use nine qubits, and our solution matched that of the brute force method of testing every path. For a graph of n nodes, we needed n squared qubits for our quantum program, which is indeed a speed up from the best classical TSP exact solution finder that takes O of n squared times 2 to the n. For future steps, we want to optimize this algorithm to be less resource intensive, as well as explore other possible approaches to TSP. We would also like to customize it so we could use maps for our graphs. One application is optimizing vehicle routing for more sustainable, efficient, and cheaper transportation. All right, here comes our challenges. We definitely face a lot of challenges on this project, such as understanding complex documentation, difficult research papers that require advanced math and quantum mechanics, and deprecated packages. There are a few key takeaways after this project. Firstly, QAOA is useful and effective for many applications in the near future. Secondly, there are needs for more developed and documented algorithms, quantum software and hardware. We would like to say thank you to our lead instructor, Richard, and all of our TAs for helping us so much with the project. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks. So yeah, I don't see any other questions online, so keep them coming, guys. But uh, if you have additional questions, uh, one question I had was around the experience of quantum software development, which is really the topic of this course. Uh, so your presentation rightly focused a lot on your results, but what was the experience like of actually developing the software um, and then later going and running it on a quantum computer or on a simulator? especially as it relates to working in a team. Yeah, so again, to for the, let me first answer like the team part of it first, we basically just set up a Git repo, a GitHub repo, and we just shared the code on that. But in terms of like collaborating on software development and making it feasible to run on real computers, we had, it was down to just reading a lot of papers and stuff because lots, like lots of people have done implementations of this, QAOA and TSP, but never in link, like not necessarily in the languages we did or solving the problems that we did. So I guess it was mainly a bunch more of reading and translating code and like understanding the fundamentals of like the gates and the circuit diagram and like the control flow of that whole thing and then implementing it into Qiskit and Q Sharp. Yeah, we had a great question online. So how did you shift your thought process from thinking about conventional binary bits to thinking in terms of qubits. And I would say more generally, just um, shifting your, your, your logical thought process from just the quantum computing paradigm from the, the classical computing paradigm. Um, it definitely was difficult at first because it's a whole new way of trying to think and it's a whole different type of logic. Um, but I think since we like honed in a lot on the basics in the first two weeks of the course, it wasn't too difficult because we kind of adjusted to this new type of thinking pretty easily. Yeah, I might I might add to this and say, I think that uh, this group is um, uniquely talented and in a great position to start thinking about this new type of information processing um, since, you know, there are also many of them are still new to programming. 
uh, on a classical computer. And so um, we've kind of taught a version of this course to professionals, practicing engineers, and sometimes they have a harder time changing the way they think. And so uh, for these young people, I think um, they, they picked it up really quickly. So, but that was a great question. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so that was Blue Mandrels. So next is Fruz. Hello, we are Team Fruz from Quantum Software. My name is Shravika Pindiala. Hi, I'm Mina Chan. I'm Grant Sackman. And I'm Daniel Cho. And for our BWSI final project, we explored the variational quantum classifier. But before we begin explaining this algorithm, let's first talk about what quantum computing is. Quantum computing is a new and exciting area of computing where principles of quantum mechanics are applied. Quantum computing uses units of data known as qubits or quantum bits. While a normal bit must be either a 1 or a 0, a quantum bit can be in a probabilistic state of both a 0 and a 1. This is called superposition, the first fundamental property. While superposition allows for the creation of these possibilities, interference amplifies the possibilities we want and reduces the possibilities of the state we do not want when we finally measure the qubits. Taking the analogy of a coin, using superposition and interference, the coin is now spinning, but we only know if it's a heads or a tails once the coin stops spinning. This concept is known as measurement, and the last fundamental property is entanglement. This is when we measure a single qubit, and based on the output, we're able to determine the states of the other qubits. The main advantage of having these properties in quantum computing is parallelism, meaning that whereas in classical computing, one step is completed at a time, in quantum computing, all steps are happening simultaneously. As a result, quantum computers can perform on multiple qubits at once. Quantum computers use less resources and may perform less operations on tasks. Yet there are some limitations. Due to the modern hardware obstacles of quantum computing, we are limited in the number of functional qubits we can use. Since the current hardware is not sophisticated and reliable, we ultimately chose the variational quantum classifiers as our final project. Our goal with this algorithm is to predict whether a person is at high risk for heart disease from a set of data features. In order to do this, there are four stages of implementation. The first stage is pre-processing. In this step, the original data starts as unorganized classical data. We want to analyze the parameters and figure out which ones are important to feed into the algorithm. So we found the four most important features, isolated them, and normalized them, to change the range of values. The second stage is a feature map, which converts the modified classical data into quantum data that can be run on a quantum computer. As shown in the image, the goal is to find the correct slope of the plane that classifies the data, separating the red from the blue. In terms of implementation, we want to perform a series of operations on the qubit to encode the data we want. Next, a variational circuit is applied to the qubits. The variational circuit rotates the state of each qubit and entangles them, which effectively changes the weight of each parameter that will be considered on the final output. In other words, it further changes the probability of either measuring a 0 or a 1 through parameterized arbitrary rotation. Finally, after reading the output, the computer makes slight changes to the par parameters of the variational circuit until we reach a minimum value of the cost function, which is what we want. The minimization was handled in two different ways, SciPy's minimization algorithm and a naive looping method that we wrote from scratch. Ultimately, the two methods yielded the same cost function minimum, which is 0.25. As for resource usage, our algorithm takes, on average, 10 minutes to process through 624 lines of input data for 30 iterations each. This includes rebuilding the circuit for each input and then adjusting the parameters and remeasuring to calculate costs. Our circuit takes 4 nanoseconds to build, and the space complexity in terms of qubits is logarithmic um, with respect to the number of features that we have for each dataset. The circuit depth is 5, meaning the largest number of gates a qubit encounters on any given path is 5, which is good because we want to minimize the number of gates we encounter so that we run into less error in the NISC era quantum computers. Throughout our process, from finding what we wanted to create to building our final product, our team faced many challenges. All the literature that we read were from academic journals that are filled with high-level jargon and complex math. While some explanations were too high level, others were too abstract and didn't provide us with enough information to properly implement our algorithm. Additionally, 
Due to quantum computing being so new as a field, it was very hard to find good documentation and resources. An example of this being, some programming libraries were outdated and no longer supported. Another issue we ran into was dividing our task among group members. Many parts were interlaced and depended on previous members' portions to work. As well as being uniquely complex, it was very hard to help everyone. But through hard work, effective communication, and collaborative teamwork, we were able to successfully implement our algorithm with the results you saw prior. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. So yes, again, keep the questions coming online. Um, I have kind of maybe a slightly meta question uh, because this topic that you try to cover, it's, it's, you know, we just learn so much in the course. And so you're trying to cover all this in a very condensed video. So you have this big, big constraint of this presentation. So I'm curious about your team's process around how you decided of what to include, maybe what to cut, uh, and how you came up to this, uh, this nice video you produced. Um, so our team spent two days agonizing over the script for our video. Um, so initially it was like on the order of like 1,200 words long. Uh, and that turned out to be like way too long for our purposes. So yeah, we spent another like good few hours trying to cut it down um, and also synchronize it with our presentation medium, I guess, which is our slides. Um, and so that was like a huge thing that we had to do uh, it, it was challenging because we didn't know exactly what was the most essential to keep inside of our presentation. Well, I think it turned out great. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. To add on to that, I think another important thing that we need to take into consideration is the fact that this is this is a topic that might not be uh, that the audience might not be fully aware of. So we had to really make sure to explain it in more simple terms. And that took a while to process because we had just gone through four weeks of this, whereas the audience might not have as extensive of a knowledge. So that was definitely a challenge we faced with our presentation and the script. Yes. Yes, the curse of knowledge. So yes, audience, you are now all experts in quantum computing after just watching those videos. <laughs> oh, and by the way, um, we will be posting these videos to YouTube later on. So if you want to go back and check them out, I uh, highly recommend you do that. Uh, they're worth uh, re-watching here. So, um, so thanks. Any uh, any the staff have any questions? Yeah, I've got a good question. So something that I found in my personal project is that uh, no plan survives first contact. So I think I was interested in is how did your initial plan differ from your actual implementation? Okay, so I guess we kind of touched on this, but um, one of our big challenges was the division of labor. Labor. Um, so we thought like there were four circuit components. There's like the feature map, um, the data processing, the like post processing, and like uh, optimization. And we thought we could just naively cut those into four pieces that each group member could do. Um, and the problem was these are all sequential. So each component depended on the previous component to actually like work and see if we could um, actually do useful things with it. So yeah, our plan in actually coding this up shifted a lot in terms of how we divided up our tasks. Great. Well, thank you, Fruz. So next group is the trench coat Loraxes. Or the trench coat Lorax, sorry. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, we are the trench coat Loraxes and we're gonna be presenting about quantum walks. My name's Owen Matheson. I'm Ben Dodge. And I'm Foster Smith. And this is our team photo right here. Okay, so quantum walks are the quantum version of random walks. So random walks, um, are when a walker is going to take random steps around a graph. So it's going to jump in a random direction from node to node like this every single uh, iteration. Quantum walks are the quantum version of those random walks. So on a random walk, you're using normal bits. Those are a zero or a one. In quantum, those bits are going to be zero and one and everything in between. Uh, so that's going to look a little more like this. So in a quantum walk, instead of just walking in a random direction, we're walking in every direction. We're taking every path possible at once. 
Um, but in order to extract any meaningful data out of that, we have to measure it. And measuring it chooses one path to show us. So the way that we get around this, we're going to measure it a bunch of times in order to um, get a sense of where the walker is traveling on the graph. Our project was an implementation of quantum walks. In our implementation, we used a circle graph in which the walker can only either go left or right. It has a 50% probability of doing either. We also implemented a graph of a torus. As you can see, it's connected in a lattice-like pattern where each edge will connect to the other edge. For example, the 7-7 node would connect to the 0-7 node and the 0-7 node, if going down, would connect to the 0-0 node. Now, we didn't actually run this on an actual quantum computer because it would have taken a prohibitive amount of gates to run and we wouldn't have gotten any good data. This is reflected in our simulator results in which we used two state bits and six iterations. The only two possible numbers were zero and two. Running it on an actual quantum computer, we got these results, which are pretty similar to our original. We also tried using four state bits for 16 nodes. However, even with only one step, we weren't able to get good data because quantum computers currently have high error rates with decoherence and certain gate errors. So they're very limited in what you can do with them currently. All right, now let's talk about what we learned from this. First, as you can imagine, building this system came with quite a few challenges. First, this, this is a pretty theoretical concept. So most of the resources available were by theoretical physicists or theoretical physicists. There were very few existing resources on implementing this algorithm, which meant we had to do most of the work in the learning. Speaking of implementation, to build this, we, need to, we needed to write programs in two different languages with two distinct and very often contradictory paradigms. Now, you may say, okay, quantum walks, they're cool but they're just walking around a graph, right? There's not much applicability to that. Well, that's the amazing thing. Quantum walks can simulate a variety of real world systems in a much, much faster than any classical random walk, allowing us to gain new insights into our world. First, quantum walks can simulate neurons and how they interact inside our brains. They can simulate proteins folding inside our bodies. They can even simulate population exchanges and evolution in ecosystems. If you remember your, from your biology class, we can simulate Darwin's finches using quantum walks. Finally, quantum walks can also simulate or potentially simulate movements on the stock market, netting someone who figures out this algorithm quite a bit of cash. Next, there are a couple of future directions we'd like to pursue if we had more time to work on this algorithm. The first is encoding. Essentially, we'd like to create more complicated graphs and more uh, unique ways to move around them. This will allow us to simulate more complex tasks. Next, we'd like to expand our systems. Currently, we were only able to run them on very limited systems with few qubits. With more qubits, we can uh, simulate more interrelated uh, tasks. Finally, speed up. By applying certain algorithms and manipulations on qubits, we can make our quantum walk far faster than any classical walk, allowing us to simulate large systems that classical systems currently can't. Finally, thank you. Thank you to all of Beaverworks staff, instructors, and TAs for giving us the knowledge we needed to build this amazing algorithm. And finally, thank you to the audience. We hope you enjoy this algorithm as, as much as we did, and we hope this inspires you to view quantum computing as an exciting field. Thank you. Here are our citations. That's great. Yeah, so of course, the, the first inevitable question is, how did you come up with that team name and logo? That's genius. Well, any, any, any backstory on that one? Oh, boy. For it's sure. a long one. Um, I think the answer is we started as the yellow team. The first question was, what things are yellow? The first answer was the Lorax. Um, from there, we were wondering, hmm, how can we all become the Lorax? So we added up our heights. We ended up with 22 feet and four inches. Um, so basically the, our team avatar is, well, okay. There's a question in chat, aren't Lorax orange? That's debatable. Um, 
but they're yellow. It's yellow, like school buses we're, are yellow, right? We're we're a twenty two foot <laughs> Lorax in a trench coat. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, on a more serious note, and maybe I think we might end up with a little bit of extra time too. And I'd like to maybe open this question up later. Um, but, you know, have you thought about next steps uh, for, for what you've been working on, you know, after this course is over, I think for many of these projects, this is pretty legit uh, quantum computing research that you've been all been doing. So um, any plans to continue this after? Yeah. So um like like we said we said in the slides, uh, a big focus was further encoding, right? Uh, we we planned to do this originally, but we ran out of time. The, the idea was that we would construct an oracle for uh, that our coin would go through, basically creating what's called a a, a Grover coin. Um, but we really ran out of time. We could do that in a week, but it, we, it would definitely be cooler because that would allow us to simulate more complicated interactions um, and better utilize the quantum properties of the graph. It looks like Nikita has a question to you, go ahead. Can you guys come up with the chorus example and why'd you decide on it having uh, 64 nodes? Sorry, you cut out a little bit. Could you so, repeat that please? Um, how'd you guys decide on the torus graph? Like uh, what interested you about it and why did you decide on 64 nodes for that graph? Um, so, so for like the circle graph, um, that was mostly just sort of a simple implementation that we could do easily. It sort of started off as our test case, but then we got kind of in the weeds and ended up just using that as our final implementation. The 64 nodes was just sort of a property of binary numbers. Like um, I think it's five qubits or something. Um, and then we did a few implementations with different amounts of nodes, but I think our best data came from using just four nodes. So just to add on a little bit, yeah. we, we started with a line, right? That sort of gets wrapped around into a circle. Um, and because we're using that simple coin, the next step is just making that line two dimensional. So making it a square. And when you wrap it around, it looks like a torus, which is a different shape. So that's why we're calling it a torus. It's really just a square where you can you can walk from the you go up past the top and you end up back at the bottom. Um, yeah. So it's just the, it's like going from one dimensions, which is the simple version, to two dimensions, which is just a little bit more complicated. All right. So I, I don't see any more questions online. So thank you to the trench coat Lorax. And we'll go to our last but not least group, Capybaras. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cassiel. Hello, I'm Tina. Hi, I'm Timothy. I'm Noah, and we are Team Capybara from the Quantum Software Development Course. Our project was to implement the Quantum Hadamard Edge Detection Algorithm on large images. But before we break down what that actually means, let's get some background on quantum computing itself. Instead of using classical bits, quantum computers use qubits, which are the quantum analog of a classical bit. Just like a classical bit, qubits can be measured as a zero or a one at a certain point in time. What makes them unique is that they can be measured as a superposition of 0 and 1 at the same time. This unique characteristic allows us to represent exponentially more states with qubits than if we were using the same amount of classical bits. For example, 3 qubits could store information that would require 512 classical bits. Let's revisit what the QHED algorithm is. Edge detection is an essential feature in image processing, allowing us to find the borders of objects within a given image. While classical edge detection works fine for smaller images, the larger pixel values of bigger images causes it to slow down. This is where quantum edge detection comes in. The time complexity of the classical edge detection algorithm is O of 2 to the n, while for the quantum edge detection algorithm, it is O of n. This is an exponential speed up, but how does it actually do this? First, we need to encode our color intensities and pixel locations into a quantum form. Since qubits are measured in ones and zeros, we can use a group of qubits or a register to represent a binary index. When a register of qubits are in superposition, they are in older states, meaning they also represent all the possible binary combinations and all pixel indexes. For example, in the image, we use two qubits in superposition to represent four pixels. Each state also has a corresponding amplitude or probability of being measured. By applying quantum rotation gates to each state, we can manipulate the amplitude to encode color intensity. Now, instead of having a classical array of n indices, we have encoded the entire image into a length log 2 n register. This is the Hadamard's gate, a very powerful tool used in many different quantum algorithms. 
applying it on a qubit, we can obtain the following transformations. Take note of the sign flow. Another property this argument takes advantage of is the alternating zeroth qubit, which makes sense if we consider how the purity or the even slash oddness of a number always changes as we add one to it. Now to note the array of indices as i, and applying h0, so Hadamard's on qubit zero, quickly we can see a pattern emerge as we apply it on successive indices. Mathematically, the Hadamard's gates can be represented as a matrix. Applying it on a qpi, Thus, here's the following. We can see the same pattern emerge in the result. Now we have access to adjacent differences, but looking closely, it's only even to odd differences. So for example, we, only, we don't have access to C2 minus C1. The way we solve this problem is by shifting all the amplitudes right by one, rotating the last amplitude all the way around, and then performing the entire algorithm now on the new quantum state. This is the actual matrix that allows us to get the print transformation, denoted by D. Putting everything together, we are now able to obtain all pairs of adjacent differences. However, these are only in the horizontal direction, so we need to transpose the entire image and repeat the same process. This way we can also obtain um, full differences between every pixel and its neighbors. Note that this is why the quantum takes O of n time because it performs the Hadamard gates in O of one and the amplitude permutation in O of n. With a limited number of qubits, we could also only process certain size images. To combat this problem, we came up with two solutions. The first was to convert images to a lower quality before processing, but that has some downsides to it. Our second method, however, Makes images into smaller images and process them one at a time, and then combines them all together at the end. This allows us to use a small number of qubits and still process large images. Another problem we faced was using absolute thresholding. After a lot of debugging, we realized that we actually need to use relative thresholding because the distribution of pixel differences can be very different across different images. So the two ways that we came up with doing this are k adaptive thresholding and max adaptive thresholding. And combining this with the rest of the algorithm, we can now obtain some pretty incredible results, as we can see in the bottom. And this is another image which worked really well. Now, onto real life applications. There's a variety of real life applications edge detection can have, including remote sensing and computer vision. The images on the right are examples of QHED applied to pictures on the road. Additionally, with 80% max adaptive thresholding, tumors in the scans of the brain appear very clearly. These are results from our implementation. However, QHED struggles with compressed images and images with too much detail. The pictures on the right demonstrate this. Classical pre and post processing also doesn't experience a reduction in time complexity with the qubit speed up. And images must be manually resized so dimensions are divisible by the grid size as well. Plus, the value of k for thresholding must be adjusted for certain images. These are all points to improve in the future. Here's the resource estimation we had for a two by two grid. Three qubits were used in one of the circuits and the depth of the circuit was six. There are also two circuits, one vertical, one horizontal for each grid. This is important to check because as depth increases, so does the probability of error, and even with this few qubits, errors appear as shown in the green box. So although the number of qubits is a log of grid size n and this can be adjusted, it's hard to avoid. On larger scales, the number of qubits will increase logarithmically and depth will consistently increase as well. If any of you are interested in something more technical, check out the link on the slides here. It's a paper with much more detailed explanations of QHED and how it works. And lastly, as for our team name, here is us with Capybaras as an Easter egg. And here are our references and our citations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Capybaras. You're going to hit us with a, um, a fun Capybara fact. <laughs> I don't know if you know one at the top of your head, but I know you're posting some of the, the Discord during the course. Any any uh, fun fact about capybaras? Yeah, so I think they're actually the largest rodents. So that's pretty cool. Excellent, excellent. Cool. And also we discovered that capybaras can in fact swim. Nice. Yeah, this was a, a cool one because you can actually see the pictures <laughs> of, your, of your results. So, um, so that was a, an interesting one. How did you um, d decide which images to use? You just kind of picked any image out there or were there specific constraints around the images that you were able to use for the edge detection? Uh, there weren't really any constraints. Uh, first, we wanted to get kind of a variety of images, but specifically images that are related to the subjects that uh, edge detection is used in. For example, like rain MRIs or roads and cities that would be used in like computer vision. But also we did test a couple images that had lots of either details or like gradient changes, to see how effective the algorithm actually was. And like we saw in this presentation, there were some varying results, but for the most part, the algorithm worked on most cases. Yeah, go ahead, John. Oh uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how you ended up choosing this project. What was the decision process like within your team? 
Yeah, I mean, we got started off at the very beginning. We tried doing a quantum matrix multiplication, but as a lot of the other groups also ran into the similar similar problem, the research papers weren't weren't super helpful, and it was it was really tough to decipher what they were actually talking about. So we ended up switching gears entirely, um, and and we read through the list of algorithms, and and we landed on edge detection. So yes, uh, fortunately, we have some time left. We have about fifteen minutes. So if anyone has any questions online, keep them coming. But now is the fun part. We get to kind of open it up and just chat for the rest of the time. Um, so one thing I was hoping we could talk a little bit about is the guest lectures that we had throughout the course. Uh, for those of you that missed my little intro there, um, one of the things we wanted to do with this was have an opportunity for the students to meet experts in industry. So for example, we had the CEO of Xanadu come and speak to the students um, and some various experts from uh, academia as well as uh, in startups. So um, for the students, I mean, was there any guest lectures in particular or anything that you got out of it, you know, uh, themes emerging from many of the speakers that you think would be relevant to, to share with the audience today? Yeah, go ahead, Cassiel. Uh I don't want to bring up too many topics, but two things I thought were really cool was uh, one, while this course didn't was focused mostly on quantum software, a bunch of the speakers did actually come in to speak about quantum hardware, which is very cool. It did give us a new perspective and actually like a very practical perspective on quantum computing in general. And the other thing I'd quickly like to say was that um, it was also very interesting to see different speakers talk about their experiences finding careers in quantum computing. Um, from academia to industry to even startups, and their different perspectives are actually very helpful. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. So if, if I were to describe all the lectures with one cohesive theme, and a theme that I really like to impress upon the audience is that quantum computing, not only is it here, but it's here for so many people. It, it used to be that this was entirely theoretical, theoretical thing. And then later it was something that, you know, you had to have a, a physics PhD to work on. But increasingly, it is, it is something that so many different people, so many different walks of life, so many different talents and interests can be involved in. You know, electrical engineering, mathematics, computer science, just regular software development can all have a, a huge impact on quantum computing. So for me, at least, it, it showed me that quantum computing doesn't necess doesn't meet you don't have to be erudite. You don't have to be a genius to do quantum computing. And you don't have to be a, a, a theoretician, right? You, you can have a variety of skills and variety of interests and help contribute to building the quantum computers of tomorrow. And I thought that was really cool and important for you know, people listening. What a great message. Yes, I, I agree. That was something that we heard from a lot where um, people were saying, hey, you know, you, you can start working on this. Um, and this has been a theme of this course as well. Uh, that you know, many of you came in with you know, little to no quantum computing experience, and so um, I think it's a testament to all of you, but also as well that um, you know, in, in span of four weeks, you were all able to go from zero to hero with this. So um, I think it's inspiration to everybody. But yeah, so go ahead, Devesh. Um, I as much as I really appreciated the technical discussions, uh, I particularly appreciated the. Um, ones that discuss more of like the life of an engineer as it was kind of like an insight into what would be coming for most of us, I think, who are trying to pursue that kind of life. It was nice to see, you know, what, what's coming up, kind of prepare ourselves and really understand what we're getting ourselves into. So I thought that was a nice insight to, that we couldn't really get anywhere else. So are there any questions for the class? Um, keeping an eye on the chat, maybe my, my uh, thing is not refreshing, I'm not sure, but I don't see any later questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, the, that, that's some, some good takeaways. We, we had some people just try to impress upon not only is this field for anybody, but, um, a lot of the people that spoke to students were of course, very successful. Um, and so one of the things that I think is great about this program is just simply to show these students that, um, you know, the sky is really the limit. Uh, and in fact, it was it was fascinating because um, when uh, we reached out to some of these speakers, they're very excited to come and talk to these students. Um, and so the, the takeaway from that is um, you are all 
valuable. <laughs> you are all the people that everyone wants to talk to because you're the future. Uh, and so people really get excited to talk to um, smart smart young people who are actually interested and engaged uh, and want to use technology to make the world a better place. So um, maybe that's a, a good segue. I mean, Devesh, you mentioned um, you enjoyed some of the, you know, the non-technical as well as the technical. Um, was there any uh, thing that anybody wanted to share about maybe some reflections around how this technology, quantum computing, may affect the the real world and perhaps you know any ethical considerations or any um, sort of non-technical uh, uh, reflections because uh, I think many of the videos focused on the technical which is good because that's what you worked so hard on but um, but yeah so, so yeah go ahead Timothy yeah so as uh, Richard mentioned earlier quantum computing is a very entirely different way of thinking about um, classical computing information as a whole. And as a result, there's some like pretty powerful things you can, things you can do. Uh, one such algorithm is called Schwartz algorithm and um, essentially has the potential to break a lot of the current cryptographic systems we have right now and um, really change the world. Um, and so that raises some concerns in terms of like the security um, and ethical dilemmas, but also at the same time, there's a lot of possibilities for good as well. Um, you know, with the with the computational powers of uh, quantum computers, there are a lot of good that can be done in the world. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, just like any technology it can be used for for good or ill. And so um, you know, you're all good guys. <laughs> so we want to train you to be able to use this technology. So, um, so yes, uh, yeah, go ahead, Foster. I just sort of wanted to touch on how cool it was to sort of be on the forefront of the quantum computing field because it's such a new thing. And it was really cool to be in sort of like this field as it develops and sort of get a head start in that. And so I just sort of wanted to thank you for providing this opportunity and sort of touch on how awesome it was. Well, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, so, and then I mentioned earlier um, that wanted to get back to next steps as well. So all the teams, you put an enormous amount of work into your projects. Um, and in fact, I think many of the results are are significant, right? So you're, as, as Foster mentioned, you're really at the forefront of this field. And so anybody have additional plans they want to share? If anybody was thinking about... Um, you know, future work in quantum computing. Um, I mean, I, from my perspective as a kind of practicing quantum software engineer, which is a field that doesn't quite exist yet, but um, many of your results, I mean, I think could be turned into a paper. So, um, so any any thoughts right as of right now uh, on next steps, or if you want to keep in touch with your your team? Yeah, go ahead, Ace. Yeah, I mean, definitely in the future, I really want to work on implementing some of the other algorithms that were presented not just my own like i think um the i think just like in general i want to try implementing like other quantum machine learning algorithms like um phase estimation and uh i don't know um like image processing i think those are like really cool topics and it would be even cooler to just try it out with um the quantum technology that we have now but, yeah anyone else I'm gonna take that. Oh, go ahead again, Timothy. Go ahead. Yeah, so we were just discussing this like earlier, um, but we were planning on actually publishing like our results, maybe like a conference of some sorts. Um, and later on, we might work with the same team together because I really think we have like a really uh, incredible team working with me. So. Sweet, that's awesome. Okay, so I do see a question in the chat. This is an interesting question. Um, and I'm going to give it to the class. Maybe this is a quiz. <laughs> so we'll see if anybody wants to take it on. Um, the question is, when will quantum computing replace the, uh, I think that it should be traditional computing. Uh, so this might be slightly a trick question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, Ace, go ahead. You could uh, take this one. I think my answer is never. So, I mean, my take on this is that quantum compu computing is very good for specific things. Like you see, like in a lot of our projects, it's mostly optimization problems. And it's that for a reason, because 
I don't think we'll use quantum computing as like calculators or to power like basic um, computers for like the way like the way we use them now. Um, they're good for specific problems that require like lots of iterations and lots of trials and like um, yeah, and parallelism, I guess. Um, so I guess they'll never really replace classical computing. It's just more of the thought process that they'll help us, I guess, um, find solutions to spe specific problems. Uh, so uh, Noah, did you have something to add? Yeah, um, it, it's just kind of the point that the quantum software developers just try and drive home all the time that quantum computing and, and traditional computing are fundamentally different things. And therefore, it's it's tough for one to replace the other. It's 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 more of like a one is better at, at some things than the other, um, rather than 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 replacing one another. Wow, you've got the uh, your, that questioner has the class buzzing. We had a lot of hands raised and want to weigh in on this. So yeah, go ahead, Ben. So I think I, I I may take a little contradictory approach and say that at least now, no, in the foreseeable future, no. Using quantum computing is like using jackhammer to you know at using a jackhammer to write your name. It's way too much work and it's way too expensive, right? Quantum computing error rates are way too high and it costs so much to just maintain them. So we won't, we won't see that for this foreseeable future. But I can see a future in, in which, you know, the programs that we use, what, what, what we use commonly requires so much simulation that we find that quantum computers just do it better, right? We may, we may come in time with the problems that we all have to deal with, or at least all of our computers have to deal with, would be better solved by using some sort of quantum processor. But that day is far, far away, if it, if it even exists. So I would roll the possibility, but I just say for now. Nice. Yeah. Um, there's some nuance in there. So very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shravika, did you have something to add? Yeah. It's everything that the um, my team members mentioned. And think of it this way. It's kind of like asking someone, do you see a future where cell phones will, re will replace computers? You know, it's like, they're both needed and they both have their own unique advantages. It's just a matter of what applications are each respective technology used for and they're beneficial for. Yeah, go ahead, Foster. Um, so like one sort of feature I can see for quantum computers is where they sort of exist on the cloud or in like company servers, but not for like personal use because I know like IBM and, um, Microsoft and all those companies are starting to provide cloud services. And I think that's pretty well suited to the sort of nature of quantum computing and its sort of use cases currently. So that's sort of how I see it progressing. Well, so yeah, we did have a couple more questions. We may run out of time for both of them, but one that's really good here is what was the challenges of coding in quantum software, particularly um, debugging errors and problems when they occur? Was there some unique challenges with uh, debugging a quantum program versus a classical program, for example? Anyone want to take that? So yeah, go ahead, Arshal. Um, so like throughout the course, we used two main languages, Qiskit and Q Sharp. And I have to say for Q Sharp, debugging is basically non-existent. Uh, because the way it works is that when you're trying to represent a quantum state, you have some element of oneness and some element of zeroness. And when, but when you measure it, all of that oneness, zeroness goes away and it shows up as a zero or a one. And it's really hard to see like how, what's the probability of it becoming a zero and becoming a one as and basically in the, both the quantum languages we learn. But ad additionally, like when you're trying to make a quantum circuit in Q sharp, you can't, print it out you can't see how it looks like when kiss it you can't so like it's very hard to get a visualization of what's actually going on so it requires lots of like writing it down and like understanding step by step so like, in terms of debug debugging it's basically all like manual debugging like with paper and pen yeah go ahead Vibusha. You have something to add? um i think another thing that was difficult with like coding is that a lot of the packages that we're using are like newly documented or like are still um, being developed. So there's a lot of deprecation and just essentially trying to understand what each function was and seeing if like you actually have to build that function or if there's already one that exists and 
Um, and since it's like a new development field, you couldn't just like go on Google and like search up, oh, how do I do this? So you have to like really try to figure it out and really understand the principles. So it is like one nineteen and 50 seconds. So um, as much as it'd be great to, to stick around and continue discussing these, it's some good questions. Um, I think we're gonna be kicked back to the main room. So thanks everyone so much for participating uh, and huge, huge thank you to the students. They put a lot of work into these presentations, as you can see, and I'll remind you that these will be available on YouTube later. So maybe put a reminder in your phone in like a day or two, check YouTube, Beaver Works, and uh, you can find these videos up there. So thanks everybody and see you back in the main room.